Too, and I think there are Bibles also in the uh, in the chair, back of the chairs in front of you. And we turn to Matthew uh, chapter 24, verses 3 to 7. Matthew chapter 24, verses 3 to 7. Let's give you another little bit to turn there. I find that sometimes people say, turn to turn to such and such a, uh, uh, a, a text or something to re- read it, and they start reading it before I can even get to the text. So I just want you all have the opportunity. Okay. Uh, again, chapter 24, Matthew, verses 3 to 7. Now as he sat on the Mount of Olives, the disciples came to him privately, saying, Tell us when these things be, and what will be the sign of your coming and the end of the age? And Jesus answered and said to them, Take heed that no one deceives you. For many will come in my name, saying, I am the Christ, and will deceive many. And you will hear of wars and rumors of wars. See that you are not troubled, For all these things must come to pass, but the end is not yet. For nation will rise against nation, and kingdom against kingdom, and there will be famines and pestilences and earthquakes in various places. All these are the beginning of sorrows. Looking forward to what Daryl has to tell us this morning, share with us, I'd say. And... uh, I don't know about you, but it sounds pretty close to what we're experiencing today. There, I think we're ready. Turn this light off so I can see. All right, so our message. First of all, I want to welcome you all again to the Pug Boy Seventh Adventist Church. Good to see all of you here. And the message, the title of this message is In the Last Days. So before we start talking about that message, let us have a word of prayer. Dear Heavenly Father, we ask you to be with us, Lord, as this message is presented, and that you speak to all of us, and to myself included, as this message is presented. For we ask this in Christ's name. Amen. I want to continue from where I ended two weeks ago, two Sabbaths ago. It was titled, His Reward is with Him. Because we are living in the last days. And as Lori Moser used to say, in the toenails of the prophecy of Daniel 2, 42 to 44. In the toenails. Bob, in the storage room, there's, this, there's a statue in there. It's Nebuchadnezzar's statue. Can you get that for me? Because if you notice in the, in the screen image here, by the way, can you see that okay? Well, it's not the best, but um, the screen image is um, it's showing the toes the toenails, you can even see the toenails there of the statue. And that, like I said, Laurie Moser is the one who said that we are living in the toenails of the prophecy of Daniel 2, verse 42 to 44. I don't know if Bob is having any trouble finding that statue or not, but it's pretty, it's out there in plain view because I was looking at it recently. 
Oh, there it is. Thank you, Bob. So there's the statue. Nebuchadnezzar's, it's not Nebuchadnezzar's statue because when he built the statue, he made it all of gold because he didn't want the prophecy to go beyond Babylon. He wanted Babylon to be the kingdom, the one and only kingdom that will rule the earth for all time. So um, anyway, let's, let's do a quick review of this whole prophecy. God outlined the four nations or empires that would dominate the world from Daniel's time to our time today. And he named them, as you can see on the screen, the head of gold, representing Babylon, the chest of silver, representing Medio Persia, the thighs of brass, representing Greece, the legs of iron, representing Rome, and the feet of iron and clay, representing a divided Europe. Representing a divided Europe. The first empire was Babylon, represented by the head of gold, and ruled the then known world from 605 to 539 BC. And how do we know that it begins with Babylon? How do we know? Well, let's go to uh, Daniel 2, verse 38. And Daniel said to Nebuchadnezzar, You are that head of gold. So it's pretty clear. It's pretty clear that Babylon is the beginning point of this prophecy, of this long, long prophecy from Babylon's, Babylon's time right down to today. We, as, like, as Laurie said, we are in the toenails. We are in the toenails, the very toenails of that statue right now, which means we are in the last days. We are in the very end. Daniel 2 verse 39 says, But after you shall arise another kingdom inferior to yours. The chest of silver. The second empire was Medo-Persia. that ruled the then, then known world from 539 to 331 BC. And as described by the beast, uh, by the breast and arms of silver, with silver being inferior to gold, which it is even in the stock market, Gold is worth a lot more than silver, right? Um, Medo-Persia was a less powerful kingdom than Babylon. After that, another kingdom would arise that is described by the thighs of bronze or brass, which is also, yeah, which is also described as brass, as you can see on the screen. Daniel 2.39 says, Then another, a third kingdom of bronze, which shall rule over all the earth. What nation overthrew the, Med the Medes and the Persians? It was the Greek Empire, right? If you all know your history, you would say the Greek Empire under Alexander the Great. Historians have said the following about this person. I am persuaded that there was no nation, city, nor people where his name did not reach. Speaking of Alexander the Great. There seems, continuing on, there seems to me to have been some divine hand presiding over both his birth and actions. Even secular historians recognize that in the destiny of nations that a divine hand was guiding them. This is taken from Historical Library, Book 16, Chapter 12. The thighs of brass, the Third Empire, Greece ruled from 331 to 168 B.C. Daniel 2, verse 40 says, Finally, there will be a fourth kingdom, strong as iron, for iron breaks and smashes everything. The legs of iron, the fourth empire, the legs of iron, now we're down to the legs, is Rome, the Roman Empire. And the Roman Empire ruled from 168 B.C. to the middle of the 4th century A.D. Quite a, quite a long period of time. And of course, we know that Christ was born, lived, was crucified and resurrected within, during the power of the Roman Empire. And their mode of crucifixion was the cross. The greatest historian of Rome, Gibbons, borrows imagery from the book of Daniel. And the images, so here's what he says. He's borrowing images from the book of Daniel. Isn't that something? This, this historian, the images of gold, of silver or brass, 
that might serve to represent the nations and their kings were successively broken by the iron monarchy of Rome. So here's another question. Would there be a fifth nation that would overthrow Rome? Would there be a fifth empire that would overthrow Rome? Was Rome overthrown by a fifth ruling empire? No. Isn't it interesting that the prophecy says that Rome was divided? Divided. Iron mixed with clay. So in order for this prophecy to be accurate, Daniel must also describe the division of the Roman Empire hundreds of years in advance, which he did. Daniel 2 verse 41 says, Whereas you saw the feet and toes, partly of potter's clay and partly of iron, the kingdom shall be divided. The kingdom is divided just as the Bible said it would be. The ten barbarian tribes of eastern and western Europe overthrew Rome and occupied its territory. And they were, they're, they're listed on the screen again. They were the uh, Alemanni, that became known as the Germans, the Burungians, that became known as the Swiss, um, the Franks, who settled in France, the Lombards, who settled in Italy, the Saxons, who settled in England, the Suevi, who settled in Portugal, and the Visigoths, who settled in Spain. There were three other tribes that, were now, that are now extinct, the Hurli, the Vandals, and the Orthogoths. And by the way, prophecy even predicted the extinction, extinction of those three tribes. So here we are. Again, the head of gold, the breast and arms of silver, the thighs of brass, the legs of iron, and the feet of iron and clay. History confirms what the Bible said 2,500 years in advance. Isn't that something? So do you think the scriptures are reliable? History proves it. History proves it. Prophecy is certain and true. Look at Daniel 2.45 says, The dream is certain, and the interpretation thereof is sure. Napoleon tried to break the prophecy, as also did Hitler. However, both of them failed. But the dream doesn't end there. What is the next event? What is the next event? The Bible goes on to say that there is a rock cut without hands. Notice what Daniel 2 verse 44 says about this rock. And in the days of these kings shall the God of heaven set up a kingdom which shall never be destroyed. So in the days of these kings, the God of heaven shall set up a kingdom which shall never be destroyed. And the kingdom shall not be left by, to other people, but it shall break to, in pieces and consume all these kingdoms, and it shall stand forever. So, so we're talking about an eternal kingdom being established here. So the rock represents the setting up of Christ's eternal kingdom. That's what the rock represents. We're not in the, head of, we're not in the time of the head of gold. We're not in the time of the breasts and arms of silver or the thighs of brass and the legs of iron. But we are, as Laurie Mosher used to say, once again, at the toenails of a divided Europe. At the toenails of a divided Europe. We're living at the time when the rock is about to come, representing the coming of the kingdom of God. The stone that is cut without hands represents the rock, Jesus Christ. In other words, we are living in the last days. The disciples asked Jesus in Matthew 24, verse 3, Tell us, when will these things be? And what will be the sign of your coming and of the end of the age? And Christ answers the question. Christ himself answers the question. What are those signs? Christ listed more than 20 different signs. And we're going to look at some of the signs that will show us that we are living in the last days and that Christ's return is right around the corner. Which corner we don't know, quite know, but it's right around the corner. The first sign is false Christs and false prophets. There couldn't be any false Christs, and there couldn't be any false prophets if there wasn't a true Christ, and there couldn't be any true prophets in the last days, you know? There, so there had, to be, there had to be a true Christ, and there had to be true prophets in the last days in order to counterfeit it. Can anybody counterfeit a $3 bill? What? Can anybody counterfeit a $3 bill? Why not? 
because a $3 bill doesn't exist in the first place, right? There's no such thing as a $3 bill. So why would anybody try to counterfeit a $3 bill that doesn't exist? Same thing here. Because Christ existed and still exists today in the heavenly kingdom, and prophets exist today, there are prophets today, then, of course, there's going to be false Christ and false prophets also. In Matthew 24, verse 24, Christ says, For false Christ and false prophets shall arise. And Jesus said that before his return, there would be an explosion of interest in psychic phenomena, in the occult, such as astrology and the New Age movement, New Age beliefs. Newsweek reports that the number of Wiccan witches across the United States of America increased from 8,000 in the 1990s to 1.5 million in 2018. USA Today reports that in 2000, 2001, there were 134,000 self-identifying witches. By October 2021, that number had increased to more than 2 million, with much of that growth coming from young women. USA Today also revealed the following statistics in, in the United States of America. In the 1990s, there were 8,000 known witches. We're only talking about known. In 2001, that number increased to 134,000. In 2008, increased to 340,000. In 2018, as I already mentioned, to one and a half million. And in 2022, that number has, had increased to over 2 million, over 2 million known witches. In the United States alone, we're not talking about the rest of the world. So there has been an explosion. There has been an explosion. A Christian leader, mag leadership magazine, recently published a whole article on satanic influence and the occult. And they received thousands of letters by ministers requesting help and assistance with this problem. The next sign is international conflict. Do we have international conflict in the world today like we never had before? Are we on the threshold of, of what could be world, world, known as World War III? Jesus said in Matthew 24, 6 and 7, you will hear of wars and rumors of wars, for a nation will rise against nation and kingdom against kingdom. By the way, all these signs that I'm presenting, all these signs are in operation today, all, all at once. We're not just talking about here and there and the, that time in the past and this time in the present and that time in the future. We're talking about them happening right here and now like never before. I think I heard Bob say something about that, like that, like never before. During the last century, we had World War I with around 20 million deaths and World War II with around 50 million deaths. In the 20th century, the world experienced the Korean War, the Vietnam War, the Iran-Iraq War, the Indochina-Algerian War, the Bosnia-Herzegovina War, and the tribal wars in Africa. Add the war in Afghanistan, Kuwait, and Chechnya, and the first Gulf War in Iraq. The 20th century was the, was the bloodiest century of them all. In the 21st century, the wars continue. There is the war on terrorism. Yeah, there's a war on terrorism, the second Gulf War in Iraq, the ongoing Israeli-Palestinian conflict, and now the Russia-Ukraine war. So I think we can say that there is definitely international conflict in the world today. Jesus predicted false Christ, prophets, the occult, spiritualism, the New Age movement, the explosion of wars, the explosion of conflict and strife, all the mass murders going on in the USA this year alone, all of this also occurring around the world. The next sign is the potential for worldwide destruction. Worldwide destruction. Never before in the history of the human race did the world have the capacity to destroy itself as it does now. Again, as a result of the Russian war with Ukraine and the USA and NATO providing weapons to Ukraine, Russia has threatened to use nuclear weapons in response. The Bible says in Revelation 11, verse 18, that Christ would come to do what? To destroy those who destroy the earth. And if that is not enough, there is also this. 
Another sign that there would be fragile peace agreements. Fragile peace agreements. 1 Thessalonians 5.3 says, For when they shall say peace and safety, then sudden destruction cometh upon them, and they shall not escape. The United Nations is supposed to be is supposed to be keep, keep, supposed to be keeping peace in the world, right? But they can't do so when a permanent member of the Security Council, for example, Russia, has veto power. They're helpless. They're helpless. Right now, with the Russian-Ukrainian war and China's sights on Taiwan, there is definitely a shaky peace in the world today. A very, very shaky peace going on. Next one is famines in the world. Famine. Is there famines in the world today? Sure is. Jesus also said in Matthew 24, verses 6 and 7, that there will be famines, pestilences, and earthquakes in various places. So now we're focusing on famines. The Russia-Ukraine war has resulted in a growing food crisis around the globe, with the price of food and gas climbing like crazy, affecting our lives today. Russia and Ukraine are the main exporters of wheat, but with the war and the resulting sanctions has brought on a growing food crisis in the world. And according to the United Nations environmental studies, three billion acres of productive land has been damaged by human activity since 1945, since World War II. And with all the fires and floods that have been happening in the last couple of years, it is probably a lot worse today. Approximately 57 million people die each year because of famine. 57 million people. And we're concerned about COVID. This amounts to 156,000 people every day. Did COVID have any stats, statistics like that? I don't think so. And this was before the war between Russia and Ukraine was even on our radar, even before that began. Sign number, the next sign, sign number six, pestilences. So I guess we're getting into COVID now, aren't we? Matthew 24, 6 and 7 also said there will be pestilences in various places. So what is a pestilence? The original word for pestilence in the New Testament language, Greek means plague or disease. That's what pestilence means, plague or disease. Could this be read as strange diseases? Before the end of time, we can expect strange diseases. Isn't that happening with COVID-19 and now with monkeypox? Two strange new diseases now happening at the same time? COVID-19 and monkeypox have joined all the older plagues such as cholera, influenza, remnants of the 1918 Spanish flu pandemic, malaria, hepatitis, antibiotic resistant venereal diseases, smallpox that continue to spread death around the world. There was also SARS, mad cow disease, hantavirus, bird flu, and the Ebola virus in various places around the world. All this happening. And, you know, another sign of the last days is environmental pollution. Environmental pollution. Isaiah 5, verse 6, 51, verse 6, I mean, says, talking about the end of time, the earth will grow old like a garment. The earth is losing its freshness and its newness. Is the war, or no, is the air and water pure today? Like it was back in the Garden of Eden? Far from it, isn't it? Far from it. Revelation 18 says that Christ will destroy those that destroy the earth. And one way to destroy the earth is nuclear weaponry. Another way is through pollution. 1,067 scientists signed a warning to all humanity that says human activities inflict harsh and often irreversible damage on the environment and on critical resources. If not checked, many of our current practices may so alter the living world that it will be unable to sustain life in a matter that we know. Of course, we know that God will not allow this. That's why the second coming can't be very far away. 
Another sign are all the earthquakes happening in the world in the last days. Matthew 24, 6 and 7 mentions the word earthquakes in various places. And, and an earthquake is one of the most devastating calamities a person can experience. Earthquakes are another sign that our Lord is soon to come. And there is obviously an increase in the other natural disasters that undoubtedly includes tornadoes and hurricanes and fires and floods. And according to the Geological Science Center, there has been a dramatic increase in the number of earthquakes. Each year we have 6,000 major earthquakes in the world. In the last 100 years or so, we've had over 1.5 million fatalities from earthquakes alone. The next sign of the last days are natural disasters. And Jesus taught that there would be an increase in all kinds of natural disasters like I'd already mentioned. He prophesied in Luke 21, verse 11 to 25, or 11 and 25, I guess, that there would be earthquakes, famines, and pestilences, and there would be fearful sign, sights and great signs from heaven. And upon the earth, distress of nations, with perplexity, the sea and the waves roaring. Jesus prophesied that there would be an increase in other natural disasters, which would undoubtedly include tornadoes and hurricanes. And are we not seeing an increase of these and other natural disasters in the world today? All these signs happening all at once. Another sign that we are in the last days is the moral decay that we are seeing in our world today. Moral decay. Jesus said that there would be a moral de deterioration in our society. They would change that which was once lawful, unlawful into something that is not now only lawful, but is even being embraced by society. I don't need to speak, say any more about that, do I? Jesus pointed back to Noah's day in Matthew 24, verse 37. But as the days of Noah were, so also will the coming of the Son of Man be. As in the days of Noah, the world was destroyed by a worldwide flood. The first time, the second time, the world will be destroyed by what? Fire. Fire. The Bible says in Genesis 6, verse 6, that mankind was so sinful that it repented the Lord that he had made man on the earth. It repented the Lord that he had made man on the earth. Then the water fell after God said that this is enough. The earth was judged by heaven back then, and judgment is in the world in these last days. There is a boundary that God doesn't allow the nations to go over, and I think we're once again approaching that boundary, but only God knows when that boundary or God's red line will have been reached. God has his red line. When God sets a red line, it sticks. It sticks. Christ in Matthew 24, 37 to 39 says, But as the days of Noah were, so also will the coming of the Son of Man be. For as in the days before the flood, they were eating and drinking, and marrying and giving in marriage, till the day that Noah entered the ark, and did not know until the flood came and took them all away. So also will the coming of the Son of Man be. Then there is the rising crime and violence as one of the signs of the last days. Rising crime and violence. The Bible also says in Genesis 6, verse 5, that every intent of the thoughts of, the, of his heart was only evil continually. Jesus predicted the rising of crime and violence, just like in the days of Noah. The Bible says that in the days of Noah, violence was rampant. Isn't violence rampant? in our world today, especially in the United States of America right now. All those mass murders, those mass killings in schools and uh, in shopping areas and churches and whatnot. And Genesis 6.11 says, the earth also was corrupt before God and the earth was filled with violence. And sometimes this violence outbreak affects whole cities and even countries. Riots have resulted from racial and economic discrimination, even from people who are normally law-abiding citizens who are carried away by the tide of lawlessness. Young people learn to deal with problems by using violence. 
In the USA alone, there have been more mass killings in schools, like I said, churches and other places in 2022 than in any previous year. This has been the worst year so far. An article in US, US New, uh, News and World Report comments. Disputes once settled with fists between kids are now settled with guns. The game wars that are going on. They're settling their disputes now with guns instead of knives and forks and baseball bats or whatever. When we went to visit a dear friend of ours in Pennsylvania, this was back in 2009, on our way back to Florida, I remember reading a sign, a road sign, warning us against road rage drivers. Road rage drivers. And, and again, this was back in 2009. And I was extremely more careful in my driving around there. I, that sort of tickled down my spine when I read that. Beware of road rage drivers. Such a scary thought. Every hundred hours or more, youth, youth die, youths die in the streets than were killed in the Persian Gulf Warfare. This is not just a North American phenomenon, but is in all the na major nations of the world. In Noah's day, the earth was filled with violence. Matthew 24, verse 12 prophesied, as lawlessness spreads, men's love for one another will grow cold. We can see this prophecy being fulfilled in the world today. The tension in the world today is proof of that. The tension. Another sign of the last days is the attitude of skepticism. Remember the prophecy of Jesus in Matthew 24, verse 39, where he said, and did not know until the flood came and took them all away? Noah preached 120 years to a people with closed ears. They closed their ears to the truth and perished as a result of not heeding the warning message of Noah. The same attitude is happening in the world today. People have closed ears. They're not listening to, the, to what's... They're not paying attention to what's going on in the world around them. They're not reading the Bible to see what the Bible has to say about it. They're, they're closing their ears to truth, and they will perish just as the people in Noah's day perished. 2 Peter 3.3 3 says, Scoffers will come in the last days, saying, Where is the promise of his coming? Scoffers are saying today that we've always had wars, famines, earthquakes, crime, and violence. Sure we did, but not to the extent we're having them now. The Bible says that those with an attitude of unbelief are actually fulfilling the prophecy of 2 Peter 3.3, 3, where scoffers in the last days are questioning whether he is really coming. How many churches are actually preaching about these in the last days? How many churches are preaching about this? How many churches are noticing what's going on in the world today and are warning their people about this? Then comes the sign regarding lovers of pleasure rather than lovers of God. 2 Timothy 3.4 says that the world will be lovers of pleasure rather than lovers of God. The sports stadiums and the casinos are jammed with people. However, attendance in our churches are decreasing. In Pogwash alone, two of, our, two of the churches have closed their, their doors, namely the Presbyterian Church and the Anglican Church, with attendance decreasing in some, if not all, of the other churches. Then there's the young people. Where are the young people? You know, we're a church full of old people. They're, well, I'm thankful that we have a few young people in their church here today. But basically, we're, a, we're becoming an old, an old church. The young people, where are they? I remember Teresa Fiera saying at one of our annual meetings in, uh, in Moncton, <clears throat> when she was uh, the executive secretary, she was saying we lost a whole generation of young people. A whole generation of young people have been lost. So where are the young people? Las Vegas is still the number one tourist attraction in the United States of America. The nightclubs and bars are filled with partying-minded people. The Bible says that men and women in the last days will be treating their bodies as fun houses, not as temples of God. Lovers of pleasure rather than lovers of God. 28% of all alcoholics are under the age of 18. That percentage might have gone up since these stats came out. Lovers of pleasure rather than lovers of God. 
The use of illegal drugs continues to rise. Millions of teens struggle with drug addiction. They are all victims of a society that loves pleasure more than it loves God. Yeah, I know, I know, I know. Along with drug use, the mass media has glorified sex and, sex and immorality. Lovers of pleasure, pleasure more than lovers of God. Bible prophecies are being fulfilled before our very eyes. We are living in very interesting times in these last days. We are definitely living in the last days with another sign of the last days being economic uncertainty. Are we living in an age of economic uncertainty now? Prior to the Russian-Ukrainian war, we weren't. But look how swiftly that changed. And that's another sign, economic uncertainty. James 5, 1 to 4, or 1 to 5 says, Now listen, you rich people, weep and wail because of the misery that is coming upon you. Your wealth has rotted, and moths have eaten your clothes. Your gold and silver are corroded. You have hoarded wealth in the last days. Look, the wages you failed to meet to pay the workmen you, who mowed your fields are crying out against you. The cries of the harvesters have reached the ears of the Lord Almighty. You have lived on earth in luxury and self-indulgence. So James here addresses the wealthy and describes the miseries coming on them. If misery is coming upon the wealthy, that is an indication of economic collapse. I don't know if, there, if we are there yet, but the high and increasing inflation rate and the market situation tells us that something is happening. You notice the, uh, the Bank of Canada has ra is raising the rates higher, and you notice the same thing is happening in the United States. And in the United States, I watched this on CNN, they asked, why are you, one of the representatives of Congress asked, why are you raising the rates? Is it, gonna, is, is it gonna do any good? Is it gonna help inflation? And the person said, no. The person that she was talking to, I think the person was the actual chairman of the, of the uh, whoever was responsible in the states for raising the rates. He said, no. Then she said, well, why are you raising the rates? He didn't have an answer. It's just the tool that they use. When the inflation was up, they raised the rates. So guess what? That causes the economy. It doesn't help the economy at all. Anyway, continue on. James says, your wealth has rotted. Moths have eaten your clothes. Your gold and silver is corroded. In other words, a quick, rapid devaluation of currency. And our Canadian dollar, I notice, is dropping. James continues to write, you have hoarded wealth together in the last days. In the last days, this is in the context of the second coming of Jesus Christ. Look, the wages you failed to pay the workers who mowed your fields are crying out against you. And then James also writes again in the next verse, the cries of the harvesters have reached the ears of the Lord Almighty. You have lived on earth in luxury and self-indulgence. It is evident that at the end of time, in the last days, there will be disparity between those that have and those that have not. The gap will be wider. You know, I remember the uh, oil companies have been, have been uh, accused of price gouging. Right? They're making profits like they never made before with the high price of, of gas today. And it will be, according to James, economic difficulty. Another major and perhaps the final sign is the gospel going to the whole world. The gospel to go, the gospel to the whole world. The sign of the everlasting gospel going to the whole world is what will end with the second coming of Jesus Christ. Matthew 24, verse 14 says, And this gospel of the kingdom will be preached in all the world as a witness to all the nations, and then the end will come. And then the end will come. This is what our church has been commissioned to do. The three angels' messages are, here, are, to, be, are to be repeated along with the message of the fourth angel. Revelation 14, 6 and 7 says, Then I saw another angel flying in the midst of heaven, having the everlasting gospel, to preach to those who dwell on the earth, to every nation, tribe, tongue, and people, saying with a loud voice, Fear God and give glory to him, for the hour of his judgment has come. And worship him who made heaven and earth, the sea and the springs of water. The everlasting gospel is being proclaimed around the world through various ways. 
Men and women around the world were hearing the gospel, and many of them were being baptized. Tens of thousands were being baptized every year in China. They were. The doors were opening for the gospel. I'm using were, past tense. Then came COVID, which shut down just about everything around the world, including many of our churches. However, technology has, has enabled the church to continue spreading the everlasting gospel message around the world. With all of these signs being fulfilled before our eyes, we are on the threshold of the next relevant sign. We're on the threshold. It hasn't happened yet, but we're on the threshold. Another sign in the last days will be that of true and false worship, where true and false worship collide. The central issue in the earth's last conflict will be about worship, either worshiping the creator or worshiping the beast or the created. Revelation 14, verse 12 says, Here's the patience of the saints. Here are they that keep the commandments of God and the faith of Jesus. This describes a group of people who will worship their creator. They will not worship the beast or his image. Revelation presents two groups. One group that worships the creator and the other group that worships the beast. Does anyone have the mark of the beast today? I think we all know what the mark of the beast is. Maybe we don't. We'll, we'll take a look here. The mark of the beast is the mark of papal authority, which they exercise by changing the Sabbath from Saturday to Sunday. But nobody has the mark of the beast today. Nobody has the mark of the beast today. Until church and state unite by enforcing the counterfeit Sabbath, which hasn't happened yet, but will happen just before Jesus returns, nobody has yet received the mark of the beast. No one will receive the mark of the beast until religious legislation is passed enforcing the substitute Sabbath. Does Revelation teach that our historic freedoms will be eroded? Does Revelation teach that this will happen during, during a time of crisis in which a mandate will be enforced? Does Revelation teach that a counterfeit religious revival will unite the churches under the medieval church and a counterfeit Sabbath enforced? The Bible predicts a coming confederacy of religions attempting to unite church and state. As men depart further and further from God, Satan is permitted to have power over the children of disobedience. He hurls destruction among men. There is calamity by, sea and land, by land and sea. Property and life are destroyed by fire and flood. We see a lot of that happening, don't we? Satan resolves to charge this upon those who refuse to bow to the idol which he has set up. His agents point to the seven-day Adventists as the cause of the trouble. These people stand out in defiance of law, they say. They desecrate Sunday. Were they compelled to obey the law for Sunday observance, there would be a cessation of these terrible judgments. And my, uh, where am I here? And this result in the uniting of church and state. That's what's, that's what's going to result, the uniting of church and state. Revelation 13, verses 16 and 17 says, He causes all, both small and great, rich and poor, free and slave, to receive a mark on their right hand or on their foreheads. What does it mean that they, were, they will receive a mark on their right hand or forehead? What's the forehead a symbol of? The mind. The mind, right? You're in... You are intellectually convinced, in other words. The hand is a symbol of force. Force. Somebody grabs your hand and pulls you along where you don't want to go. The symbol of force or coercion. People either accept the church-state union and a counterfeit law or are forced to accept it. That, and that no one may buy or sell except one who has the mark or the name of the beast or the number of his name. Refraining from work on Sunday is not receiving the mark of the beast. And, there will, and where this will advance the interests of the work, it should be done. We should not go out of our way to work on Sunday when the Sunday laws come into effect. Because that's, they're going to happen. They're going to happen. When those who hear and see the light on the Sabbath take their stand upon the truth to keep God's holy day, difficulties will arise. For efforts will be brought to bear upon them bear against them to compel men and women to transgress the law of God. Here they must stand firm that they will not violate the law of God. We must stand firm in, in these days. In those days. It's not these days. We're not there yet. Revelation 13 verse 15 adds, 
Another fearful dimension by saying, he was granted power to give breath to the image of the beast, and that the image of the beast should both speak, and cause as many as would not worship the image of the beast to be killed. We are to be faithful even unto death, from which we will, re we will receive the reward of eternal life with Jesus Christ, our Savior and Lord and King. At present, Sunday keeping is not yet the test. The time will come, however, when men will not only forbid Sunday work, but they will try to force men to labor on the Sabbath and to, and to subscribe to Sunday observance or forfeit their freedom and their lives. But the time for this has not yet come, for the truth must be presented more fully before the people as a witness. Indeed, a union of church and state powers would challenge our historic freedoms that we take for granted. This is a longer message than usual, I guess. I didn't realize that I had such a long message, but I'm almost at the end. God will have a group of people who will follow the Bible and the Bible only, where they will follow God's word only and not the traditions of men. In the days of Peter, the religious leaders united with the Roman state powers, and Peter was thrown in prison and denied Peter the privilege of preaching the truth. Acts 5, verse 29 said, Then Peter and the other apostles answered and said, We ought to obey God rather than men. The issues in the last days will be to either obey the commandments of God or to obey the traditions of men. We will, we will either obey a divine command or obey a substitute. The law for the observance of the first day of the week is the production of an apostate Christendom. Sunday, is that hasn't happened yet. Again, this is future. Sunday is a child of the papacy. That's now. Sunday is a child of the papacy, exalted by the Christian world above the sacred day of God's rest. In no case are God's people to pay it homage, but I wish them to understand that they are not doing God's will by braving opposition when he wishes them to avoid it. Wonderful scenes are opening before us, and at this time a living testimony is to be born in the lives of God's professed people, so that the world may see that in this age, when evil reigns on every side, there is yet a people who are laying aside their will and are seeking to do God's will, a people in whose hearts and lives God's law is written. In the last days of Earth's history, God reaches out to us. Many have never understood these issues before, but it is God's message of love to a lost world. <clears throat> For God so loved the world. God wants us to be that last and final message of love to a lost world while we still have the opportunity to do so. Dear Heavenly Father, may we, may we be that, may we be the messengers to a lost and dying world. May we, while the opportunity is still there, may we proclaim the everlasting gospel to every nation, tribe, tongue, and people around us. May we do our part in finishing the work that you've called us as a church to do. We are in the last days. All the signs are fulfilling all around us at the same time. And we know that when the end days, when the very, very last days arrive prior to the second coming of Jesus Christ, these future events will be rapid ones. They will come rapidly. They might start slowly, but they'll pick up speed. So Lord, may we take advantage, well, well take, up, take up the opportunity while the opportunity is there to finish, to help finish the work. For when we Proclaim the gospel to every nation, tribe, tongue, and people. What's the next great event? It's the second coming of Jesus Christ. Thank you, Lord, for your promises, your precious promises. Thank you for showing us these signs. And thank you, Lord, for showing us just where we're at in the world today. We're in the toenails of the prophecy of Daniel. We're at the very, very, very last days. There's not too much else left, left to happen except, except these things that, that I just mentioned already, Lord. So be with us. Lord, we pray. May we rededicate our lives to you. And may we be willing to stand up for truth, though, though the heavens fall. For we ask this in Christ's name. Amen.